Hello, uh, good morning and welcome to this exciting new session as part of this wonderful conference. Uh, in this session, we are going to talk about educating legal education, the globalization of legal education. Uh, legal education has passed through different phases, such as internationalization and transnationalization. Uh, when we talk of internationalization of legal education, it has ensured that we moved beyond the purely local con conception of law towards developing specialized areas of practice and research, such as conflict of laws and public international law. Transnational law has ensured that we study different jurisdictions. Uh, but in the last few, few years, the legal education has passing through the phase of globalization, a process that has brought countries and peoples closer due to massive developments in technology, reduction in the costs of transport and communication, and the disintegration of barriers to the flow of goods, services, and investment. This deepening integration has presented both a new set of opportunities and challenges that legal education has to confront. Opportunities refer to greater learning prospects, such as adopting globally accepted best practices that can be contextualized and emulated in teaching, research, and academic administration, bigger and better employment opportunities for young law graduates. Likewise, challenges uh, 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 that globalization has brought in newer areas, such as international trade, international finance, and international capital that require regulation. Also, when we talk of globalization, we should be mindful of the challenges it poses in terms of climate change, heightened income inequality across the globe, which in turn has triggered a backlash against globalization seen in the form of waves of increasing nationalism and populism in certain pockets of the world. To discuss many of these issues and some of these issues in this panel, we have an exciting uh, set of speakers with us. Uh, let me very briefly introduce the speakers to you before I go on to these speakers. Uh, we have with us Professor Dr. Natalia G. Praskina, the Vice Dean of uh, FEFU School of Law, Far Eastern Federal University, Russia. We also have with us Professor Dr. Byron Garth, the Interim Dean and Distinguished Professor of Law Emeritus, University of California, Irvine, United States of America. Uh, I also have uh, Professor Dr. Jan Holloway with us, Dean, Faculty of Law, University of Calgary, Canada. And last but not the least, we have Professor Dr. Kelly Vitesti, the President of Law School Admission Council, United States of America. Uh, on behalf of uh, Jindal Global Law School and OP Jindal Global University, I welcome all of you to this uh, exciting panel discussion. And let me start by... Uh, by uh, kicking the discussion by asking the first question to Professor Praskina uh, about the challenges that she thinks legal education is facing in the wake of globalization, including the phenomenon of backlash against globalization in certain pockets of the world. Uh, Professor Praskina, if you could uh, share your views with us on this. Thank you. Dear distinguished participants, uh, it is my great honor and privilege to take part in this Global uh, Law School Summit 2021. First of all, I would like to extend my great appreciation to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Raj Kumar for his kind invitation and to all involved in organization of this uh, outstanding event. Pakistan Federal University has been <clears throat> in partnership with uh, OP Jindal Global University and Jindal Global Law School since December 2016, when we concluded our cooperation agreement. And since then, our relations proved to be strong and long-term, and we hope to develop further working ties with your respected university and the law school. I believe this summit is in some sense symbolic as next week uh, on December 6, our president of Russia will be visiting India and meeting with your prime minister, Mr. Narendra Modi to discuss the most privileged <laughs> strategic partnership of our countries. By, by the way, Mr. Modi has visited our university <clears throat> campus in Vladivostok back in 2019 during his participation in our Eastern Economic Forum. And this year he was participating online due to COVID restri restrictions. Moreover, this event is symbolic for us uh, as today we celebrate the National Lawyers Day in Russia. 
And uh, I'm also very pleased to be today on board with distinguished panelists, colleagues from the United States, Canada, and India. I have very fond memories about kind and hospital people and have beautiful uh, countries which I visited and where I studied before. I studied in Middlebury College, Vermont, and McGeorge School of Law in uh, Sacramento, California. Uh, our university has a federal status, which is like the top status among all universities, and our school of law is uh, on top law schools in the Asian, in the Pacific part of Russia. As far as um, uh, this question, as far as global challenges are concerned, we should consider probably guides and results of surveys made by professional global organizations and legal stakeholders. And um, last year, there was a research um, and there was a report May, uh, made entitled Developing a Blueprint for Global Legal Education, which was undertaken by the International Bar Association and the Law School's Global League with coordination of IE Law School from Spain. And the results were discussed at, at the International Bar Association conference last November. So this, um, the key challenges uh, that are global and common, this uh, uh, research uh, was uh, conducted around the world in Africa, Asia, Australia, Canada, the European Union, Hong Kong, Latin America, and the United Kingdom. Uh, this research analyzed uh, a lot of articles and scrutinized um, more than 400 uh, law schools websites. Um, they were a lot of interviews made with top officials of law schools and deans. And the key challenges, for the sake of time, I will not uh, tell in details about them that we discussed uh, at the International Bar Association. So the key challenges for legal education identified included globalization, technology, regulation, diversity in all forms and affordability and access to legal education among students. So all the above challenges are worth to take into account in order to deal with them and identify and carry out respective precautionary measures. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Priskina, for sharing uh, your views on this question. Let me now turn to Professor Garth. And uh, Professor Garth, my question to you is that are the law schools, and especially uh, the law schools that we have in the Global South, uh, do you think that they are equipped to deal uh, with these challenges that Professor Preskina mentioned, that globalization today uh, presents to the legal education in general? Well, I'm going to take a slightly different tack to this question in the sense that I don't think it's just about whether individual law schools are equipped for the challenge but whether the kind of politi political economy of law schools in any particular jurisdiction are up to the challenge. Because I think one of the, the problems that has engendered backlash is that partly of deregulation of law schools, we have in India more than a thousand law schools, in China, a thousand law schools, in Brazil, Mexico, we have these huge numbers of law schools and only a very small handful where you have to have strong English skills to enroll, where you have tuitions often that are much larger than the tuitions at the at the the schools for the many. And you have very selective admissions that means that almost the only people who can get in are those who come from fairly privileged backgrounds. And in many places, they have no access to the jobs that are created by, um, elite globalization, you know, such as in corporate law firms, which have spread around the world and are also part of the reason why we have all this reform in legal education. So one of the, and that engenders uh, resistance. There's a whole movement in South Africa to kind of reject this whole global enterprise because the, especially the, the traditionally black law schools are feel completely excluded from the rewards that come with it. So the challenge is to make not just law schools more accessible, but to make the, the benefits of globalization and global jobs 
human rights and law firms available to those who uh, don't have access to the very small, small group of schools, which now feeds into the global jobs. Yeah, thank you, Professor Garth. I completely agree with you on the question of accessibility to legal education. Uh, and uh, uh, now I turn to Professor Holloway and a linked question to what we have, we have been discussing in the last 10 minutes. Uh, given, the, given the restrictions on access to legal education and the challenges that globalization presents, uh, what do you think uh, are the innovations and reforms that need to be carried out in the curriculum and the pedagogy of legal education? Well, th thank you, uh, Prabash. Um, you're right, my answer does build quite nicely on what Natalia and, and Brian had to say. Um, in, in North America, we traditionally said that the mission of a law school was to teach students to think like lawyers. That was the expression we used, to think like lawyers. And I think that holds true still, um, except that I would modify it and say that our mission today has to be to teach our students to think like global lawyers. Um, when, when I started out, and I'm not that old, but when I started out, the, the term jurisdiction was a, a comfort term for lawyers because it signaled when, when something stopped being my problem and became another lawyer's problem in, in, a, in another part of this country or another part of the world. Now, of course, jurisdiction is... a uh, is built into almost every legal issue. I mean, even the most modest clients nowadays will increasingly have interests that transcend the borders of, an, of any one country. Now, I don't believe that it's the job of most law schools to teach, the, to, to teach foreign law. I mean, many of us do, we, we do, we teach American law, we teach English law and French law and so on. But, 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 but our core mission is, is to teach our students to become uh, uh, Canadian lawyers. But what we need to do, though, is inculcate a sense of what I often refer to as global mindedness uh, in, our, in our students. So to look at legal problems, not just through a domestic lens, but through a, a global lens. And in some areas of the law, that, that, that is perfectly intuitive. Things, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Prabash, things like environmental law, the I mean, we, we just saw a, a big international summit dealing with, with climate change. And if anything ultimately is going to change, it will have to change through law. Um, human rights law, of course, is by definition uh, a global thing. But even things like, like business law, corporate law, you know, I mean, the, the phenomenon of, the, phenomenon of the, the Delaware Corporation, I mean, that, that long, long ago outgrew the bounds of the, the you know, the, the, the small state of, of Delaware, USA. Um, any corporate lawyer, no matter where she or he may be practicing, has to at least be aware of the of what a Delaware corporation is and the and the significance of it and what impact that may have upon uh, the the domestic operations of a company in a in a foreign trade law. So I think it's that that globalization is already pervasive, and therefore um, as those uh, those whose whose role it is, whose mission it is whose sacred mission it is to prepare the next generation of legal professionals, we owe it to them. We'd be shortchanging them if we didn't uh, consciously, assiduously work to instill a sense of global mindedness. In terms of pedagogical reforms, I'll say, I'll say two things. Um, the first, um, uh, and I actually mean this, uh, is that we, need, we all need to become more like Jindal. Um, uh, you, uh, uh, and I'm not saying that just because I'm speaking here at a, at a conference hosted by, uh, by the Jindal Global University, um, what you have been doing since your foundation has really been holding up a torch for the rest of us to follow. You've done that through the, 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 the kinds of professors, kinds of faculty uh, you've appointed, you've, you've done it through the, the, the extraordinarily vast array of international linkages that you've developed. You've done it through the pathways, the, the, the pipelines, to use a Canadian metaphor, uh, for students that you've developed to, um, to introduce them to careers in, of course, in India, but in, in Great Britain and the United States and here in Canada as well. So we all need, that's the first thing. We all need to be more like Jindal. The second thing I think we need to do, and this is, a, this is really a... a this is really lighting a torch uh, in terms of the, the conventional way that we approach legal education in North America. 
but that is that we have to break down the dichotomy between theory and skills. The, the whole model of legal education in North America and, and also in much of the rest of the common law world is based upon this idea that law school is meant to be a, a theoretical introduction to legal study and that in their early years of practice or as an article clerk, uh, the system we still have in Canada, um, they will acquire practical skills. But the fact is we now know a lot more uh, about how adults learn and how they retain than they knew in the latter part of the 19th century when the conventional model of legal education was developed. And what, what brain science tells us is that adults learn and retain best when they, when they, as I put it metaphorically, sometimes roll up their, their sleeves and get their hands dirty with ideas. In other words, when they actively engage um, with the, 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 the subjects that they're dealing with. In other words, that the dichotomy that we draw between theory and skills is a false dichotomy. If you want to teach lawyers how to properly do things, you have to teach them why it is that they've that they do things in that way. And in the common law world anyway, that reflects an accumulation of, of precedents dating back almost a millennium. Um, conversely, if you want to teach someone theory why it is we do them, you have to teach them how, how to do them. So that's the second thing I would say. So be more like Jindal and break down the dichotomy between theory and skills. Those are my two prescriptions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Holloway. That's very, very uh, encouraging uh, for, for us. We are still a young law school. Uh, and I completely agree with you that uh, uh, introducing the global lens to, to study subjects is something which is very, very important. And at Jindal, we definitely try to try to do that. Uh, and, and since we are talking about the uh, reforms in curriculum and pedagogy, let me now turn to Professor Testi and ask her that what strategies she thinks law schools can follow in this regard. Uh, for example, can a double degree program through international collaboration, uh, can, can something like this be a, be a way forward for introducing curriculum and pedagogy reforms? Question, and uh, it's really nice to be with you all today. And I wanna start by also recognizing Dr. Kumar and OP Jindal University. Uh, the Law School Admission Council is proud to be a partner with you in your law school admission and in so many other ways. And so it's a delight for me to be here with you today. So I wanna preface my remarks by saying that I'm gonna speak both as LSAC's president, someone who works now all the time at the start of a legal education, encouraging students to attend law school and making sure that admission processes are fair and transparent and ethical but I also wanna share some reflections from the eight years I spent as the Dean at the University of Washington School of Law that uh, as many of you know, has one of the uh, most distinguished and oldest Asian law centers in the, in the world and very much known for its global outreach. So let me start by saying that I think when we begin to talk about reforms that may happen, we could start by realizing that the entire pre-law to practice pipeline is one that we have to attend to. If we work really at only one segment of that, we won't have the impact <coughs> that we hope to have for legal education. And so one of the things that I would like to uh, begin by suggesting is that at, at LSAC, we're very proud of the LSAT, which is the best test of critical thinking for law school admission that there is in the world. And I congratulate Jindal for using the LSAT India for its admission. I think starting with admission is critical because it shows students that the pathway is a fair one. It's that it's one that rewards potential and not just privilege. Because until law serves all of the world, it won't reach the potential that it has to make the world a more just and humane place. In terms of curriculum and pedagogy, I'd like to also there share that one of, there are many different kinds of programs that can work. Um, the joint program was one that you mentioned, and I absolutely think those are outstanding. But in my experience, one of the things that works most effectively is making sure that people are meeting each other. And as Jindal does, and as so many universities do, that there's a constant transfer and a connection between students and faculty and administrators to share common concerns, to share best practices, to learn from one another. 
And so I think any way you can accomplish that mixing, if you will, that's where you'll see great change happen. We certainly saw that in the work we did early on in China, Japan, and Korea in, at the University of Washington. Um, and lastly, the other point that I would make um, today is that I think we all need to be mindful that when we start to talk about global opportunities, those, those can't mean just opportunities that go to elite and that are at the highest level of big law firm practice. When we think about globalization, I like to suggest that we think about educating every lawyer to be a leader for the global common good, to have the skills in law, the supplemental skills that need to go with thinking about legal doctrine and theory, skills like financial literacy, skills like leadership ability, and of course, ethics and integrity and that care for the common concern. If the pandemic we've all been through has shown us anything, it's shown us that our world is deeply connected and that without that concern and care for what happens on a global basis, law cannot be bounded any more than something like a pandemic can be. So I encourage us to think about it in that broad sense and look forward to more discussion with all of you today. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Testi. I, I completely agree with you that uh, one of the very important reforms that have to be made uh, is to ensure that legal education uh, does not remain elitist and it kind of reaches everyone. Uh, every student who is, is bright and who wants to study law should be able to study law. I think that's a very, very important uh, point that you make. Uh, uh, let me now turn to Professor Priskina once again. And, you know, since we are talking about these reforms in curriculum and pedagogy, Professor Priskina, uh, in India or in Global South, uh, our experience has been that there is often shortage of skilled human resources uh, in the law schools, you know, to train students in these newer areas of law that have become dominant in the area of globalization. Uh, so, for example, we have a lot of expertise in, in, in traditional uh, areas of law, such as constitutional law, criminal law, administrative law. Uh, but we really struggle to get quality faculty and human resources in these new areas, such as international finance, international investment, etc. Uh, how do you think this challenge can be addressed? And, uh, you know, what has been your experience in Russia uh, on this regard? Uh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting and hard question at the same time. And uh, we have similar problem in Russia. So the short answer is that we have, uh, yes, we have similar sit situation in Russia and we call this uh, staff shortage hunger for experienced staff. <laughs> so some law schools are just hungry for skilled human resources and some just starving, which makes them vulnerable in the world of competitive law schools and high quality of uh, legal education. And uh, being from <clears throat> uh, non-English speaking country, you know, Russia is a non-English speaking country. I would also name here not only human resources uh, skilled in new emerging branches or institutes of law, but also faculty members with high, com uh, high or good command of English language, which are necessary for teaching in international programs, in international courses. For instance, our school of law, which is like top one in Pacific part of Russia, uh, we have hardly 20% faculty members with good command of English. And this is definitely one of our significant disadvantages. And in other law schools, Russian law schools of our region, the situation is even worse. So how we, um, how we deal with this uh, problem, uh, we uh, send our faculty members for professional training programs. We use programs of visiting professors, both from the most qualified national and foreign institutions. We also use partnership programs on faculty changes and other measures which law schools may afford taking into account our regulatory, of course, material logistical, personal, and other reserves. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is indeed a 
a problem and uh, you know i think i think uh, uh, all the developing countries are kind of facing this problem uh, uh, let me turn to you professor garth and from your long experience in academia and in academic administration uh, what what are your views on this in terms of the the shortage or the non availability of skilled human resource uh, in law schools especially uh, uh, you know in these in these new in, in these new subjects that have become uh, important in the area or in the in the time of globalization okay i think i will introduce a little provocative note into our discussion which is to note that globalization is not just a uh, something that was inevitable and happened because just of technology and some of the things that you mentioned, but it relates very much to the rise of US power after the Cold War, US modes of regulation and governance, the spread of US style law firms and investment banks, and very much the uh, much of the US approach to governance has been in a way exported, but also imported around the world. So there's a kind of core and periphery in a way. So these new subjects, you know, all of the ones you mentioned, you know, like the corporate governance, uh, investment arbitration, international commercial arbitration, financial matters are things that if you want to learn the cutting edge, you almost have to go to New York or London. And that puts a special burden on uh, countries other than those that are close to this kind of core how do they both master, and you can master it by having Zoom calls and have somebody teach it to you, but these rules also, you know, come with uh, a tilt toward those who made the rules. So what you want to do, and I've seen people at Jindal doing this, I've seen it in Brazil, is you learn the rules knowing that the WTO or International Commercial Arbitration is not necessarily a completely level playing field but you learn how to play and you try to move the rules so that they accommodate other interests that maybe weren't there. For example, anti-dumping in the WTO was created by and for the US, but other countries, Brazil, China, India, learned how to play. And so it's not just that you need the mastery of these new areas that are now so important in, in the globalization that we have now, as opposed to globalization when it was the British Empire or somebody else, and have to learn to play this game and be able to excel and, and um, you know, further the interests in those rules, you know, along with mastering the rules. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I agree with you completely. And I can say this from my personal experience. You know, I work in the area of, of trade and investment arbitration. And when I started teaching trade law in India about a decade back, uh, there were hardly uh, very few law schools in India where, where trade law was taught. Uh, but today, uh, a decade later, almost every law school, or well, at least the important law schools, all of them offer a course on trade law. Uh, and this is because India has been a very active player in the WTO. And you mentioned about anti-dumping. India happens to be the highest user of anti-dumping duties. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, uh, I guess the important point that you make is that through, uh, through your human resource, you can also play a role in trying to shape uh, you know, the rules of, of globalization. Uh, Professor Holloway, if I may again uh, come back to you and sort of, you know, a very important thing that we see in this area of globalization is that lawyers uh, or, you know, uh, uh, even academics, they have to continuously keep themselves updated because there's so much that's happening all around. Uh, uh, and therefore, in this, in this regard, uh, you know, there's this new concept of continuing legal education, which has, which has become quite important. Uh, now, what are your views on this? Do you think that this can be an important tool to retrain and reskill lawyers in the area, in, 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 in these new areas of law, especially in this area of globalization? Prabash, I think in th this is actually the most important question of all. And in, in a way, it's, it's more important than uh, what changing, talking about evolving the curricula in law schools, because we kind of do that anyway. Um, 
we all know that the legal profession, uh, I, I don't know about Russia, but it's probably as true there as it is in Canada or the USA or India or Great Britain or Australia or New Zealand, uh, is, uh, is conservative by nature. Um, some might say resistant to change. Um, we also know that there's a, a famous uh, a scholar, a business scholar uh, named Peter Drucker, who once wrote famously that culture eats strategy for lunch. Uh, in other words, we can, we can talk and plan for change, but unless the culture changes, uh, then change really won't take place at all. And so if we, wa if, if we really want to make the most of the opportunities that globalization uh, presents to, um, to, to, to make the lives of, of humanity better, to protect the environment, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, further safeguard human rights, to prevent war and so on, um, we need change uh, in our professional culture. And, and, and the way to do that, of course, is to get lawyers to want to learn. Um, and, and so this has been one of the greatest challenges in North America. I mean, you know, most jurisdictions in North America now have um, forms of compulsory continuing professional uh, legal education. But it's also true, I think, that in most jurisdictions in North, North America, many lawyers don't take it seriously. It, it becomes, as we say, a, a bit of a box ticking exercise. Um, so the question then is how can we motivate lawyers um, because, of course, they're going to shape the mind, no matter what we do in law schools, they're going to shape the minds of, 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 of uh, the young lawyers who join their offices. How can we motivate them to want to, to, to get aboard the, um, the globalization train? Um, because that train is leaving the station, whether we like it or not. Um, and I think it's possible to do so, but, but we need... Um, in order for this to be successful, in order for cultural change really to take place, we need the bar councils uh, and we need the courts uh, to, to come to the party. Um, we need the bar councils to really put teeth in these continuing legal education, continuing professional development requirements. And we need courts to say, um, I'm not going to hear you, counsel, because uh, you haven't fulfilled your uh, continuing education requirements. Uh, I'm going to I, I'm going to disbar you. Um, that's the kind of thing that we need. So I think it's possible, Pravash, but I think it needs a lot more teeth than at least in this country or the United States we've given it so far. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Holloway. At, at Jindal Global Law School, we are trying to develop a program on continuing legal education. Uh, and I completely agree with you that it should not just be a box ticking exercise and some kind of carrot and stick policy, uh, you know, uh, would be would be useful to ensure that it actually achieves the purpose for which it has been set. Uh, uh, Professor Testi, if I may come back to you again, and you know one of the concerns that we often hear uh, these days is that because of you know globalization and because of uh, growing interest in certain areas of law which are considered to be more lucrative or maybe uh, might generate more jobs for law graduates. Uh, uh, we see a tendency among students that they kind of uh, try to neglect uh, or maybe not, not give much attention to traditional subjects or theoretical areas uh, of study. Uh, and therefore, these areas are being pushed to the margin. Uh, would you agree with this uh, from your experience? Uh, and if yes, then what do you think uh, can be done? Thank you very much for the question. And, um... There's really two different angles on this. So let me outline both of them. The first one is that students, when they're going to make the investment of legal education, of course, are looking for a way uh, to realize uh, a living and, and profit from that investment. And so as they're thinking about where to go and what to study and then how to progress through legal education, they're, of course, mindful of their career and, and making a uh, that investment worth it. And so that's something that I think pushes toward certain fields where the payoff for being a lawyer is much more lucrative, as you've, as you've noted. Um, what's difficult about that and what cuts in the other direction is that in many ways, that's not necessarily what's in the heart of the student when they begin. And we do extensive studies of law applicants, asking them, why are you interested in law school? What is it that's drawing you there? 
And over time, the answer to those questions has changed quite dramatically. And it's not in the direction of going more toward making money. It's going away from that in the sense that one of the common answers used to be, it's a way to make a great living. My, my father was a lawyer and he told me to go to law school. Those were common responses. Today, the top three reasons people go to law school all are different ways of saying that they care about the world and they wanna make a difference in it. They wanna make positive change and they care about justice and claims for justice. And so I have sometimes been known to tease my faculty and say, please don't turn gold into lead. Um, those, those students come to law school really wanting to make law align with justice and to be able to see themselves in a role that helps them work for justice. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us in legal education to understand that part of the complexity of our task is that we take students from all kinds of fields and then they go into all kinds of fields. And what's difficult then is we have only a small amount of time to make sure that we're providing the kind of education that can even that up a little bit as they come into law school and then open all those very different doors and empower them for a lifetime in law in what are vastly different fields. Yeah, uh, I agree completely. And if I may offer an analogy from cricket, I don't know how many of you follow cricket, uh, no matter how popular the T20, the shortest version of the game becomes, uh, test cricket, the five-day version will still, will still remain popular. So I guess uh, no matter how important courses on investment or trade or commercial arbitration become, uh, I guess courses like jurisprudence or constitutional law or administrative law will still continue to be popular. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Testi, for sharing your views on this particular topic. Uh, let me uh, now come to a slightly different area, which uh, some of you have already touched earlier. Uh, and this, for this, I'll turn again to Professor Preskrina. Uh, you know, uh, in the last few years, we see that while, while there is globalization, but there is also a backlash uh, against globalization. Uh, and we have seen this becoming becoming important post Brexit, or post you know the the the, the victory of uh, Donald Trump becoming the U.S. president, uh, and the rise of right wing forces all over the world. Uh, now this backlash against globalization and uh, this deepening of nationalism and rising populism that we see all over the world, uh, this is also bound to have an impact on legal education as well. Uh, uh, so my question to you, Professor Priskina, is that what kind of impact do you think it would have on legal education and uh, how best legal education can, can respond to these challenges? Thank you for your question. Um, speaking about Russia, we are a multinational, multi-religion, uh, multi-language country, and in general, people are quite tolerant and are against various manifestations of nationalism or populism in our country. Moreover, it is uh, strictly prohibited by our legislation on its highest level by the constitution of the Russian Federation. And in, in recent years, president of Russia has attacked uh, nationalism several times, in particular, to the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Russia. He demanded to strictly suppress uh, the propaganda of nationalism, xenophobia, religious enmity, violence, pointing out nationalism as the first among the priority threats. It seems that um, diversity uh, in students and faculty members may be seen as one of the efficient responses to minimizing or limiting, deepening nationalism, and not, not, not only in terms of um, internationalization, but also diversity in different variables, such as diversity in terms of location, whether it's rural or regional, maybe gender diversity, cultural diversity. And in addition, law school's curriculum, cur curriculum may be amended by respective courses. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Praskina. 
Uh, I'm curious to know the views of uh, our panelists from US and Canada on this question, because this is a question which I guess, uh, you know, affects uh, both the global north and the global south. Uh, uh, any one of you, Professor, Professor Garth or Professor Holloway, Professor Testi, would you like to say anything on this rising nationalism, populism, uh, or the backlash against globalization because of this feeling that it has only helped the elite and it kind of hasn't helped uh, the working class? Uh, and what impact do you think it's, it's going to have on legal education and how should we respond to it? Can I, can I, will I say, start? Well, go ahead, yes. Brian. You, you go ahead, Brian. You go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to start yeah, with a sociological, first, yeah. a sociological truism in a way that is, is for law to matter in, in any particular country, it has to adjust to the changing politics or law will be marginal and will not be a player in the language of governance. And so inevitably, as, as there is a reaction to globalization because this style of globalization with China rising, with uh, nationalist movements everywhere is, is going to be challenged. And we can't win that in the law schools. So in part, we're going to have to find ways it, inevitably, whether we want to or not, to adjust and in a way tame it, legalize it, make it so that if there is nationalism and even authoritarianism, that it is rule where there are, are administrative rules, there are things that control it. And we've seen that happen in the past. So from my study of you know legal education for many years, I would say it's not, legal education will not lead the way, unfortunately, to preserve the things that we'd like to preserve. I, I yes. want to say, I, I agree with Brian completely. I mean, law is the master of society, not its, uh, sorry, is the servant of society, not its, not its master, at least in a society which really embraces the rule of law. But to me, I, I think that the, the, the challenges, the backlash against globalization, put another way, it's a cry for leadership. Um, and and the time we're living through now is a very, very trying time for leadership because what we've seen, what, what has gone along with the rise of nationalism is the rise of populism and a suspicion of expertise. Um, you know, it's one thing to be skeptical about elites who are elites simply because of who their parents were or how big their bank account is. But to be skeptical of someone uh, who's, you know, quote, elite, because they happen to have spent many years studying in a university and uh, and have worked very hard. That I think is dangerous. Um, and uh, you know, I don't mean to hold the United States up as a as the archetype of this, but but the, the fact that someone who was so consciously anti-intellectual as Donald Trump could be elected president. Um, I, I think speaks volumes about the, the global challenges of leadership that we're facing. And he's not the only one. He's just the one that's closest, ge you know, uh, geographically to, to, to me. Um, and and, and it, it, it's a, it's a w w in Canada, we're already facing the consequences of this. And, and the current President Biden is, is, is in his own way, just as nationalistic as, uh, as, as President Trump was. And so a small country, I mean, we're Canada's very large geographically, but we're small in terms of, we're small demographically. We need trade, uh, uh, you know, we need uh, uh, globalization. Um, and um, and we're, we feel right now in Canada that we're fighting a losing tide against, uh, against nationalism and, uh, uh, and insularity in the United States. And it's, uh, it's gonna make both countries worse off uh, um, the unfortunate thing is we seem to be the only ones who, who feel it right now. Yeah. And I think it's a challenge for India too, but, uh, but anyway, let, 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 let Kelly speak. I, I don't want to go on too long. Uh, no, no, Professor Holloway, you can complete your point. Well, I think, you know, the uh, India, the, the, the Indian economic miracle, um, I mean, India is blessed because they have a large internal market. I mean, a, a massive internal market. And so they're 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 buffered from some of the some of the the headwinds that a country like Canada faces, and the rise of 
of economic nationalism. But, but really, India's economic miracle um, was built on, on trade. And, and to carry that miracle to the next level uh, means that, that, uh, that India you know, needs trade as much as, as, much as a, a, a Canada does. And trades not just in goods, but also trades in services. And that, as you will know better than me, Prabhash, that is a particular challenge facing the legal profession in India. There is, there is a great resistance uh, to, um, to opening up uh, trade in legal services uh, to the to the global world. I, for one, think it's a, it's an opportunity for Indian lawyers, not a threat. But I know that the Bar Council of India doesn't quite see it that way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Professor Testi, would you like to share your views on this topic? I wish I didn't agree with both Dean Garth and Dean Holloway, but I do. <laughs> um, I, but I will say this, that there is one more aspect that's a little more hopeful, perhaps. Um, and that is that I think the questions you've posed and also India's own leadership really do situate legal education at a time when it's more important than ever. Uh, it's more important than ever because of the suspicion Dean Holloway noted about proceeding based on evidence. It's more important than ever because of the rise of populism and the idea that whoever shouts the loudest wins. Um, it's more important than ever because of the deep differences that we see uh, everywhere. And law and legal education have a leadership opportunity to help people bridge those differences, to understand difference without being disagreeable, to find ways to bring people together, to find way, you know, pathways to peace. And that's something that I think really uh, is right now an even more urgent opportunity for legal education uh, to step up and to provide the leadership that Dean Holloway noted. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Testi. Uh, we have about uh, 12 to 13 minutes left in this session, and we have some audience questions uh, with us. Uh, I'll, I'll put this question to Professor Garth because this question, one of the questions is on the question on, on, on the issue of accessibility. Uh, and the question is as follows. Uh, is there a way to implement a practical approach when we speak of increasing access to law schools uh, in areas which are deprived of the benefits of globalization? Uh, do you think this could be possible through the law schools, which already have a privileged access to the benefits of globalization? So I guess the question is about uh, what are the practical practical steps that can be taken uh, to ensure that there is a wider access to legal education? Professor Garth? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the national law schools are moving into all kinds of different parts of India. So you have a sort of an outreach in that way. And, but for me, I would focus a little more attention on what can you do with the schools that are not the uh, the famous schools, and can you bring them in? You know, we we have a project on called After the JD, where we study lawyer careers in the United States, and we're writing a, a kind of a concluding book. And one of the conclusions that's kind of sad is if you don't go to a top law school, your career is one of of uh, accelerating. Uh, accelerating decline in a way that is because it, things don't build on each other in the same way that they do. Whereas if you happen to be someone who's got a really good education um, from your parents and you get into one of the top law schools, it's accelerating you know, right from the start and it continues. And what I would like in my little idealism here is I would like some recognition in India, the US and other places that the, the places where the disadvantaged are trying to make a career in law, which is an upward mobility career, ideally, are often in the schools that are not the hardest ones to get into, but are the schools that you know, provide opportunity for those who don't have the advantages that they need to you know, score well on tests, for example. So, I think when you focus on the general access, you also focus on paying more attention, you know, bringing them into the game, finding jobs, you know, recognizing that there are talented people there who didn't get advantages. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and if I may say that the democratization of the legal education uh, could be one of the ways in which we increase uh, yes. access. Yes. Uh, uh, that Professor was Holloway, fake democratiz democratization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Holloway, there's a question on clinical legal education, uh, a point that you emphasized. And the question is, is basically in two parts. Uh, firstly, the question of emphasizing on the continuing legal education of practitioners or lawyers who are who are in the areas of, you know, in these areas which are important because of globalization. Uh, and second is on the question of continuing legal education for the faculty members themselves, people who teach these subjects uh, in, in, in the law schools. Uh, what do you think would be the strategies in this regard? Do you think it would differ uh, from, from practitioners to academics? Well, it, it, I mean, it may differ in presentation, but it's similar in the sense that it's it's all about incentives. Uh, that so, you know, as as law school deans, we have at least some ability to incentivize people to want to to want to improve themselves and and not to have not to not to, to stagnate in in career terms. Um, I really do believe, though, that in terms of the 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 practicing bar, the practicing profession, the incentives have to be. Uh, sticks as much as carrots, and maybe even sticks more than carrots, uh, and which is why I, I, I talked about the the bar council and the uh, and the courts, uh, being being uh, critical partners, uh, critical partners in this. <clears throat> in terms of cl clinical legal education, <clears throat> I actually think that's a that that's a, a wonderful opportunity to do what I said I think is important, and that is to break down the dichotomy between theory and skills, but it's 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 possible to do it in a way that that helps one's community. One's community, um, you know, the traditional mock model of legal clinical education we have in North America tends to be around legal aid clinics, and most law schools have them, and and, and they're very important. But it's possible to provide uh, set up clinics to provide free legal services to small business people and entrepreneurs, uh, to uh, to help immigrants. Uh, to uh, uh, to provide uh, you know some form of free legal assistance to people in family disputes who, in a perverse way, when they most need lawyers, it's when they can least afford it. Um, so th I, I think that is a it's a, a golden opportunity to really improve legal education while making a real material difference for the better in our in our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Holloway. Uh, uh, we have a question on uh, the on the issue of skilled human resources and the lack of it. And I'll turn to you, Professor Praskrina, because you talked about this and the problem that that and the fact that you have this problem in Russia as well. Uh, now, the question is that do you think the lack of skilled human resources could be one of the causes behind legal educations and law schools being elitist? Could you please repeat the second part because I didn't I didn't hear the second part. Of yeah, the sure. So, so the question is that is the lack of skilled human resources one of the causes behind legal educations and law schools being elitist? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I think so. Um, that uh, there is a close connection to that, and um, maybe there is no uh, universal recipe or magic pill to that we should um, we should aim to have uh, as much uh, skilled um, professionals as possible but uh, at the same time we need to take into account uh, to kind of maintain a certain balance so for example while integrating into the world educational space uh, we should also preserve the dignity of our own uh, legal educational system and of our own uh, law school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Praskina. Uh, we are almost at the end of the session, just a few minutes left. And uh, I'll now give an opportunity to all of you to sort of present your concluding remarks or your concluding observations on this, on this theme. Uh, and let me start in the reverse order. So let me first go to 
uh, Professor Testi. Professor Testi, any concluding observations or remarks that you have? Yes, and thank you. I've enjoyed the conversation and being with all of you. I want to thank you for that and wish you all well. I think the closing uh, couple of remarks that I would have us uh, think through is, first of all, to the last question um, that uh, uh, Professor Kapuskina answered. One of the answers could be the better use of collaboration through technology. And that's something that I think we haven't had time to talk a lot about, but I think that will present an opportunity um, that we should all take better advantage of. That doesn't mean there aren't impediments to it. Um, I think so often, for instance, about the fact that in every law school in the United States, we teach four sections of the same course every year and how much efficiency and how much lowered cost there would be if we did that differently. And we could, but there are real impediments to that because of the need for each school to be financially viable on, it, on its own. Um, but I do hope that we can find ways to use technology to further collaboration. And uh, that's something that I know is the subject of other panels and I think holds great promise. Thank you. Uh, Professor Holloway, your concluding remarks. Thank you, Prabhash. I, I think that one of the things that we could do much better at in law school is, is, is telling the story of why law is important and why legal education is important. I mean, Bryant uh, touched upon a couple aspects of this, um, but, but, I, but I, I think of India. I mean, if, if you look at how important lawyers were to the formation of India, I mean, you know, Gandhiji, uh, Pandit Nehru, Sardar Patel, Dr. Ambedkar, they were all lawyers. Yet if you look at the image that lawyers have in the popular media in India, which reflects the image that many ordinary Indians have of lawyers, it's not very positive. And I think that, that and perhaps this goes to my leadership point, that, that we, all of us involved in, in the legal profession, including those of us involved in legal education, have not paid as much attention as we may have to telling the story of law, um, to being to being leaders in telling the story of law. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Holloway. Uh, Professor Garth, concluding remarks? Okay, I'll, I will try a little sociological point um, as a kind of concluding thing, which is there are places like, there are fabulous global law schools like Jindal, Getulia Vargas in Brazil. And what they've created really is you know, something that's uniquely global. And one of the challenges of all these globalized law schools is where do they exist in their own social world of the legal profession? And, and like in Brazil, the, the, the law professors there cannot challenge the rather conservative in certain ways, uh, dominant lawyers who are part-time professors, part-time uh, lawyers, part-time business people, part-time politicians, part-time public intellectuals who, when they teach their courses, they just have assistants teach it in the same way they have forever. And I think one of the challenges of the national law schools and of Jindal is that the bar is very conservative and still goes to the government law college in Bombay, where there almost is no teaching. So Part of the challenge is how do these global pockets, you know, do they do they challenge, do they modify, do they quote modernize those who are in many ways at the top of the profession, but able to resist reform? And in India, the uh, the advocates and the judges control the global law schools, so they can resist change coming from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Professor Priskina, your final comments. Yes, thank you very much, all colleagues, for great uh, discussion today. I think that to conclude, uh, we face a highly ambitious and important undertaking that requires um, concerted effort from all those who involved in shaping the future, uh, future legal architecture of a global society. And um, we remember that the world is small, small legal world, world is even smaller 
legal world with technology is even much more smaller and we are all interconnected. Just yesterday I had a telecom with Indo, Indo Russian Chamber of Commerce and Industries about their upcoming visit to Vladivostok and about establishing a sea route uh, from Chennai to Vladivostok, which will make a lot of legal questions and we will have to deal with our legal specialists in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been an absolutely fantastic discussion. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a lot. Uh, uh, globalization definitely presents several opportunities and challenges. And of course, we all have to keep working together in our own ways, the different parts of the world to maximize the opportunities and to, and to minimize the threats or to face them only. Uh, I thank all our four distinguished panelists to, uh, you know, for, for their excellent uh, presentations and for answering all the questions. Mm -hmm.